It's my pleasure to introduce Katie Farmer. Katie Farmer was named President and Chief Executive Officer effective January 1, 2021. She also leads BNSF's Board of Directors. Katie has been with BNSF for 28 years, which is hard to believe. Uh, most recently serving as Executive Vice President and Chief Operating Officer since September of 2018, overseeing the entire operations organization. In that role, Katie led the team responsible for operation of trains, maintenance of tracks, structures, and rolling stock. Uh, she has an undergraduate marketing major from the Neely School. <laughs> she has a Master's of Administration from the Neely School. Uh, she's the Board of Trustees of Executive Committee for the TCU. She is past chair of the Intermodal Association of North America, past president of National Freight Transportation Association, Board of Directors, Executive Committee, Fort Worth Symphony Orchestra, Sustainer and Junior League of Fort Worth, member of Jewel Charity, benefiting Cook's Hospital, and the list goes on. And one of the things I'd like to say is, I've been here so long that Katie Farmer was actually one of my students in a marketing class <laughs> in the 80s. And I know we're not supposed to have favorites, but Katie knows that she was one of my favorites in that class. And Jeff was also a student back then, knew Jeff well. Their son, uh, Patrick, who was a Neely Fellow, just graduated. He was one of my students. Caroline is a sophomore, and she's in the Neely Leadership Program. And Caroline, you're running out of time to get into my class, so we've got to, <laughs> it's got to happen. Well, we're excited you're here, Katie. I'm particularly excited you're here. So uh, without further ado, let me bring up the best jurist in Tarrant County, <laughs> Dean Daniel J. Pullen. All right. All right. Well, thank you, Bill, and thank you for all that you know, outstanding and wonderful news. And um, it is a really exciting time to be affiliated with the Neely School of Business. Um, you know, we focus on um, a brand promise. We talked about marketing just a second ago. We, we focus on a brand promise every day. It's really the only business school in the country that I've seen that makes this, this daily commitment to its stakeholders just like you. And we call that the Neely Promise. And it is to unleash human potential with leadership at the core and innovation in our spirit. And I think that promise is on, on full display today it's on full display every, every, uh, every hour in our classrooms and corridors. And I think if we just reflect over the last couple of years and what we've all had to go through and the shared sacrifices that we've had to make, leadership and the need to innovate is more important now than ever. So I think we have the right message, the right business school, the right town at the right time. And I'm excited to have this, this conversation. I'm also excited to have this conversation because the way we're able to curate this community and, and convene um, as we do today is on the back of some amazing partnerships and amazing sponsors. And so I really want to recognize our platinum sponsor, Frost, our gold sponsor, the Fort Worth Business Press, silver sponsors, Lindbeck, Balcom Agency, and bronze sponsors, Dunaway, Acme Brick, and the good folks at McDonald Sanders. Really amazing testimony. Yeah, let's thank our sponsors. <clears throat> really a testament to the co-investment that's required to allow us to, to further convene and educate uh, so many of us. And I think there's 350 of us today, which I'm told is a record crowd in the history of the Tandy Executive Speaker Series. So, so thank you very much for investing your time. And thank you, Katie, for investing yeah. your time Absolutely. and allowing us to have this conversation. I'm just, I'm really excited to get into some real, real meat stuff here today because it's all on our minds. And then, you know, let, I know you know almost everybody, but you probably don't know everybody yet. And so you're just such a I wonderful... I figured it was a record crowd because everybody wants to know where their stuff is. So. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to ask you about that. I know, you're not Question here for me. Two. You just want to know where your stuff is. So. Uh, but it's, it's, just, it's just a great time. So we'll, let's, we'll just, let's just start there, right? Um, uh, we, I think we, we, we've all felt at a very personal level the, the disruption in, in the supply chain. Walk us through that. What are some of the, like the root causes of this uh, supply chain crisis, and how are you thinking about it today? Sure. Well, I mean, it's certainly a, a complex question uh, because, as, as many of you know, the global supply chain is a complex uh, mechanism. And so I'll, I'll touch on a few of the parts of it. certainly won't be comprehensive with everything, but... 
You know, if you go back to when we really started to feel pressure on the supply chain, you have to go back to the spring of 2020. And recall what was happening in the world, and particularly in this country. We were moving into the beginning of, of a global pandemic. And um, many of us were um, being forced to work from home, uh, quarantining. And so you saw a lot of people moving from schools and office environments, um, moving into the homes and working. And so we saw a shift from an economy that basically was split between consumer goods, services, and entertainment experiences. And as people moved home, we saw that shift very quickly into consumer goods for the most part. Um, and so for our railroad, and, and you, know, you think about what that meant, that basically meant that people were shopping on Amazon. <clears throat> people were, and I'm sure nobody in this room, ordering lots of toilet paper. Um, uh, you know, and, and so people were working from home and ordering online from Amazon and, and, and really panic buying. So what you saw was record consumer goods coming into this country. At the same time, you saw parts of the economy that were decreasing quickly. So for example, at our railroad, coal. We ship a lot of coal. Um, when people were moving from schools and environments, office environments, there was not as much use for utility generation. Um, and so you very quickly saw ships backing up on the West Coast through the ports of LA and Long Beach. And then you saw other parts of the economy that were shutting down, manufacturing shutting down, uh, those environments shutting down. And so our business was really a mix of those things. You saw our coal shipments and things like that go down dramatically. Um, and you saw us go from a railroad that was handling around 200,000 units a week. We think that's a busy railroad. And within a series of weeks, we were down to 150,000 units a week. And so what we did, as many parts of the supply chain did, is we had to furlough employees. We started to store locomotives. Uh, and you saw the, you know, that kind of gearing down of the supply chain. As, as people moved home and started ordering record amounts of consumer goods, you saw that part of the supply chain quickly ramp up. And for what for that, that meant for us is we went from 150,000 units, it was almost like a hockey stick up to 200,000 within literally several weeks. So we brought all those people back who had been furloughed. We started taking equipment out of storage. Um, and then we were able to ramp back very quickly. Now, that's not unique for us. We're a reflection of the economy. And so we match resources with, with business all the time. However, you had that going on across the ocean carrier industry, the drayage community, the warehouses. And so you had this disruption happening in the supply chain. The other big thing we had happening across the, the global supply chain, predominantly in the United States, is real pressure on the labor market. And so if you think about what also happened during this time, there was significant stimulus dollars, that, relief dollars that were being granted. And so labor was coming out of the market at a time where really we needed it most. And, and let me tell you a little bit about how that translated across the supply chain. So using our operation, we bring intermodal trains. We, we do business with UPS, FedEx, Amazon, all the people that were bringing all that toilet paper to your front step. When that happened, and, and we started to, to handle all of those trailers and containers, we would typically bring those into, for example, our large facility in Chicago to go to distribution centers that, that then go to Amazon that then get trucked out to your doorsteps. During that time, the drayage community, um, we were, drivers were being taken out. They decided they're either going to stay home or they're going to, to gravitate towards some other part of the supply chain. And so we had less drayage capacity pulling those units from our facility to go to the distribution centers. In addition to that, the distribution centers were struggling with labor as well. So when that drayman would get to unload the product at the distribution center, it would take longer because they didn't have the staff to unload. So then the drayage capacity that was already pressurized was, was taking longer, and so that longer cycle, chain, cycle time took velocity out of the supply chain and capacity. So we would bring trains in, we'd unload the box from the train, and we'd have to stack the box inside of our facility. Typically, we'd either unload to a chassis, it'd go right out, or it'd stay for a very short period of time. At the, at the worst part of the supply chain crisis, we had 30 trains holding on our line across our transcon from Chicago to Los Angeles, Staging. Each of those trains are two miles long with 250 boxes on it. So at that point, we had 6,000 units of 53-foot 53 53 containers waiting to unload in our facility. 
And at one point, it got so bad that we had to make the decision that we were going to put mats down on the rail tracks inside of our facilities to stack boxes. So that, that was what happened to us. Now, it got better. Um, so we, we did work our way through some of that. You know, some of the, the capacity and the labor came back. Now, to the question of, is it over? I, I, I'm sure you guys know it's not, right? Um, you see the pictures that I do. Um, and, out on the West Coast, you see the vessels that are waiting to get into the ports of LA and um, uh, Long Beach. In fact, last week I was actually out um, at the port of, of LA with the executive director, Gene Soroka. Took me on the water and I said to him, I said, Gene, there's still, you know, looks like hundreds of ships out here. He said, yeah. And I said, what, what's, the, what's the biggest obstacle to, to, to really solving this? And he said, labor. And he said that every day, they have gate allocations that go to draymen coming into the facility. And they have terminals like we do, where they stack boxes. And draymen come, and they take it either to local, or they take it to our facilities to put it on a train. He said that every week, 6,000 gate allocations go unused. And he said, nobody comes at night, and nobody comes on the weekends. And so the good news is, in all of this, the good news is, is there's enough infrastructure in this country to handle the volume that wants to move. The challenging news for all of us is it's got to be used differently. Um, I think we'll adjust. I think just like the supply chain has done over time, we'll evolve and, and we'll figure out better ways to do this. But right now, we have a significant labor problem. Um, we have a, a, a supply chain that doesn't operate 24 by 7. The railroad has always operated 24 by 7. Distribution centers are going to have to operate 24 by 7. The ports are going to have to operate 24 by 7. And we're going to have to find a way to bring labor back into um, really a, a job that, frankly, a lot of people don't want to do now, which is drive a truck. Yeah. So as you think about that, and it's not over, um, but you've got to balance every day sort of the, you know, the near term, how do we yeah. get through this and keep the trains moving on time, so to speak, versus any long-term systemic shifts, whether mm -hmm. that's this move to consumer goods or online shopping. Right. How do you think about just the future um, reality of how you'll run the company? Yeah, I, you know, we um, have been preparing for what we're seeing. Um, for, for BNSF, intermodal is our largest growth opportunity. Um, last year alone, we moved over 5 million intermodal units. And so when I say an intermodal unit, I mean a trailer or a container. So the hard part about our business is we have to invest, you know, five years, 10 years in advance. And so we have spent probably 2 to $3 billion dollars um, over the last couple of years, investing in double tracking the Southern Transcon from Chicago to Los Angeles. Um, we have continued to invest in our intermodal facilities. Um, we are the primary carrier, as I mentioned, for companies like UPS, uh, Amazon, FedEx. And so we're, we're going to continue to invest in that part of our business. You often don't think about railroads, like you just saw, as being a part of two-day delivery or overnight. Um, but what we do do is we take that freight from the West Coast um, and we, we bring it to those distribution centers. And so I think for us, Daniel, what we're going to have to continue to do is to invest heavily in that part of our network to be an option. Um, one of the things that we have done that we think also has benefit long term, um, we've invested in logistics parks. And um, so just right up here at Alliance, we worked with Mike Berry and the Hillwood Group um, to invest in, in logistics parks, which are basically, we use our intermodal hub as the, the anchor, if you will. And then we get the folks I just mentioned, the Amazons, we get Target, the Walmarts, people like that, that have distribution centers that then can dray to those facilities. And so what that allows us to do, basically, is to better utilize that precious resource of trucking. Because when you can tell a truck driver that he can be home, he or she can be home at night, have a regular schedule, not have to drive across the country, and have a regular income, that's a differentiator. And so again, that goes back to having to evolve the supply chain and think about how we do things more effectively. Yeah, so. I, I think that's, real, that, that, that's really compelling in that you're, you're really finding yourself not just looking internally and inward as to how do we optimize our role in the supply chain, yeah. but really thinking systemically across the whole supply chain and, and how, how might rail improve the overall supply chain, not just our link. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, 
So when I was a kid, I loved model trains, and I loved um, you know, the technology of it all, and, and, and I know that they're changing. Um, and a lot of us may still have that image of you know, somebody with a shovel and coal putting, you know, putting in the locomotive, and that's, and that's what a train is. But that's really not what trains are today, and they're changing. So for this you know, kid model train fan, tell me about the trains of the future. What, what are we going to see? Yeah, sure. So, you know, one of the um, things that we see our customers asking for are sustainable solutions. And um, we see our customers' customers making buying decisions based on their values much more so than ever before. And so we have customers like Amazon asking us, how can you be greener? How can you be more sustainable? Now, what I would tell you is that the competitive advantage that we have as a railroad is we are the most cost-effective and greenest solution to move freight by land. But we can be better. Um, if you think about, though, where we're starting from, rail, you can move one ton of freight 500, mi 500 miles on a single gallon of diesel fuel. So when you think about that and you compare that to trucks, you know, trucks, we're about three times more fuel efficient than trucks. Now, with that said, I, I want to just pause there, though, because this gets into how we're going to look in the future. You might think, oh, well, trucks are your biggest competitor. They're a partner for us, for sure. And so I mentioned that we really replace that long-haul trucking piece. And you might be surprised to know that our largest customer at the railroad is a trucking company, J.B. Hunt, um, and then closely followed by the, the UPSs and the FedExs of the world. Um, and so, so they use us for that long haul portion. But what we know is that we can be even more green, if you will, than we are. And so um, when we look at um, the, the locomotive of the future or what we're going to look like, um, we are going to focus on a commitment that we've made to reduce our emissions by 30% by the year 2030. And the way that we're going to get there is through this railroad of the future, the locomotive of the future. And um, we're going to do a couple of things. First of all, we know that um, to reduce emissions from the locomotives, that we have to be more fuel efficient. It's like your cars, right? If you can use less fuel, you're obviously more fuel efficient. So we've had lots of programs in place around throttle limiting inside the locomotive. We have trip optimizer that tells our locomotive engineers as they're traversing across different terrain, how do you most effectively utilize um, fuel? So we've been doing all of those things. But in addition to that, we're also going to look at um, using renewable diesel. Um, fantastic. It helps us. We can blend that with existing diesel. Um, the only limiting factor for us right now on that is supply of renewable diesel. Um, in addition to that, we have to work with manufacturers like General Electric uh, that makes our locomotives, uh, Watco now, to be able to blend more renewable diesel in our locomotives. Um, we're going to use um, hybrid technology. I am really excited about this. We just did a test early last year on a battery electric locomotive, if you can believe it. Um, and um, we ran it out in the state of California, first ever revenue uh, pilot of a battery electric locomotive ever. Um, and we did it in a hybrid consist. So we had a diesel locomotive with a battery electric locomotive. Fantastic results. Um, saw exactly what we had hoped to see. So that's really exciting. The challenge is the battery capacity right now. And so uh, manufacturers are working really hard at that. I think that's going to come along. We're going to have uh, the ability to store enough energy that we can run this across you know, some of the trains that we run across, getting that regenerative power and being able to densify it and store it is the challenge that we have. Um, but I, I think that's going to happen. It's going to happen within the next several years. Um, in addition to that, we just announced a, um, a, a partnership between us, Chevron, um, Progress Rail, and um, we are going to, and Caterpillar, we are going to uh, pilot hydrogen fuel cell locomotives as well. So I'm really excited about the opportunity that we have. Um, it's going to make a significant difference. We're going to get to, by 2030, that 30% reduction. And so you saw our locomotives in the video. They're, they're still going to be orange on the outside, but they're going to be a lot greener on the inside. So it's, uh, it, it's, it's exciting. Well, I just want to get a – can I get a toy one when, when it's ready? Absolutely. Okay, excellent. Well, uh, again, innovation is, is everywhere, and it's how we all earn the right to compete 
every day. And, and certainly part of uh, you know, competing is understanding the, the laws and the regulatory environment against which we have the, the chance to operate. And obviously at the federal level, there's a lot of talk about infrastructure bill. Mm. And I, I'd love to get your take on what, what the impact on rail is going to be. Yeah, um, so I'll start with the positives. Um, <laughs> Um, so the infrastructure bill for us, I think the positive is, is that, you know, we should all take um, great happiness in that a bipartisan bill came out of Washington, D.C. So um, any time that, um, you know, inside the Beltway um, we can have a bipartisan effort, that's certainly a good thing. Um, and I would tell you that we also... Um, are happy that there is dollars inside that infrastructure bill that, that uh, connect the, the supply chain, if you will. So anytime you can have um, federal funds that help the different parts of the su supply chain to connect, that's a good thing. So connectors between highway intermodals, connectors between you know, the ports of LA and Long Beach, all good things. The, the part that gives us pause at BNSF is that this bill really perpetuates um, public or federal investment in, um, in different parts of the supply chain that um, are frankly competitors of ours. Um, and so, so we are, uh, you know, we privately fund uh, the vast majority of our capital infrastructure. And so what we would like to see um, is we would like to see some type of user pay model to go along with that federal infrastructure investment. And, and if you look back over time, one of the biggest challenges this country has is in our highway system. And so the Highway Trust Fund has been broke. And we continue to prop it up and fund it. And at some point, we, we have to get back to looking at some type of user pay um, system, whether that's a vehicle miles traveled, for commercial vehicles, personal vehicles, um, there needs to be some supplement to that because it's just not sustainable over time. Um, so, so that's that's. I mean, there is a provision in the infrastructure bill to dust that off and look at that again. Um, I would tell you there's good parts of the bill for sure. Um, so, uh, head of the Senate Commerce Commission, Maria Cantwell, out of Washington. Um, proposed a grant program to separate grade separate and, and crossing safety. So anytime you can separate the public from our railroad, that's a great thing. Um, the, the thing that's not in the bill and the thing that gives me grave concern about our supply chain, frankly, is um, th there's nothing relative to permitting reform. And so um, I, I, what has happened in this country, and particularly in certain states in this country, is that we have community groups and we have uh, various groups that are using the permitting process as a weapon to slow down investment in the infrastructure. And I'll give you a real, real life example. Um, we have, for going on 15 years now, um, tried to permit a facility eight miles from the ports of LA and Long Beach. We have spent $100 million in 15 years and have not turned a shovel of dirt. And think about how valuable, given the supply chain crisis we just had, if we had had a facility eight miles from the port where no trucks would have had to been involved, there wouldn't have been a labor issue. Our people showed up every day during the pandemic. We could have pulled thousands and thousands of those containers out, put it in our rail system, and got it into the interior of this country. But not a shovel of dirt's been turned because of the permitting process. And I'm not trying to permit this in the middle of LA. I'm trying to permit this in a highly industrialized, the piece of property that we were going to build this on is owned by the port of Los Angeles. So, I mean, the, the concern I have is that it will be a chilling effect. Trust me, we have a lot of resources and a lot of patience at BNSF. I don't think the rest <laughs> of the supply chain does. And so we can last, but I'm just, it, it will be a huge chilling effect on investment. And, and what that means for all of us is it is a significant competitive issue for this country long term. Well, well, clearly, I love the way you lead today, but I want to shift gears just a little bit and kind of go back in time as you were thinking as a, as a Neely student here at TCU about your career path. And did, um, 
Walk us through the decision to, to join BNSF. Did you always know you wanted to work in, in railroads or, you know? Oh, yeah. It was yeah. a dream of mine since I was a little. Because it, it was mine, right? So I'm kind of a fanboy on it. Um, but, 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 but what about for you? How did you, how did you come to Burlington? Uh, so, um, you know, for me, um, and I, I, I have um, real life examples in my house. My 22 year old, um, my daughter who's here with us today, Caroline, who's a sophomore at TCU. You know, I don't think that graduates today think that much differently than we did. I mean, you, you want to do something that makes a difference, right? And, and you, when you think about what you want to do, um, you want to do something that matters. And um, what we do at BNSF matters. And, you know, when I think about the 38,000 men and women um, in our company, 99% of them showed up every single day during this pandemic. They didn't get to shelter at home. They didn't get to quarantine. Um, and, and that makes me really proud. Um, you know, the, you saw it in the video. We talked a little bit about it. Um, the, the consumer products that you use, the clothes you're wearing, the food you just ate, um, the, the, the energy that heated your home during this last um, you know, weather event that we had, 25% of, of all the grain and grain products moves on BNSF. And so I just think, what a cool thing to do something that you can get up every morning and feel like, you know, what you do matters. And I think that that's not that different from what Caroline wants to do or Patrick or, or all the folks in this room. You want to do something where you feel like you're contributing. And so that's what drew me to BNSF. Yeah. And, uh, and, and obviously you stayed, right? How have a you, long time. Yeah. yeah. I mean, uh, how have it, you know, walk me through just a little bit of the kind of the chapters and decision points, because obviously you could have, you know, taken the off ramp, you know, any time and done other things. What's, what's really kept you there? Yeah. You know, I think for me, Daniel, um, again, it's that doing something that matters. But then, you know, you spend more time at work, frankly, than you do at home. And so you have to really like where you work. And for me, what kept me at, at BNSF was the culture. And I, I want to describe our culture to you because I really do feel like it's, it's unique and it's unlike anywhere else. Um, but to do that, I have to go back a little bit in time and history. So, so if you don't mind, I'd like to tell you a little bit about how we got to where we are as our culture. So as you heard in the video, we're a company that if you think about our predecessor railroads, the BN and the Santa Fe merged in 1995. And prior to that, our predecessor railroads go all the way back 170 years. And so um, if, if, if you think about that culture, when the two companies came together in 1995, it would have been really easy for then Rob Krebs, who was the CEO, who I know several folks in the audience know Rob, really, uh, really bright, thoughtful leader. And he could have said, I was with the BN, and he was with the Santa Fe. He could have said, we're going to take the Santa Fe culture that I know really well, and that's going to be the new culture of the combined company. But he didn't do that. What he said was, we're going to take the best of both cultures, and we're going to create the new BNSF culture. Now, he didn't just put lip service to it. What he did was he said, I'm going to take a group of leaders, and we're going to go to the Aspen Institute, and we're going to spend several days thinking about who we want to be. And so the very first thing we did was we came up with our vision, which is still as relevant today as it was back then to realize our tremendous potential by providing transportation services that meet our customers' expectations. Pretty simple, straightforward. And then he said, OK, now that we've got our vision, what we want to think about is what's important to us. And so we, we then came up with our values. So we thought about our values. But then to prove out that vision, what he said was, well, how are we going to actually, we, we know how we're going to make decisions, but how will we know we've been successful? And he came up with evidences of success. And for us, that was really easy. And it's still the evidences of success that we look at today. It's our, our customers first. It is our employees, the communities that we serve. And back then, it was our owners, because we were a publicly traded company, our shareholders, and now our owner in Berkshire. And, and we know underneath each of those, there's different things that tell us, are we being successful? Can our employees come and be safe in their jobs every day? Can the communities that we operate through feel good about BNSF operating through their communities? And so we had those evidences of success. We had our values. And then here's where I think it was the smartest thing that they did. What they said was that what we know is we can have all of those things. But when we look across the transportation industry, we're still kind of a commodity. So what's going to be the thing that differentiates us the most? And it's going to be our people. And so 
about a year or two after that, we came up with what we call our leadership model. And our leadership model has five tenets. And it says that every employee will be held accountable not just for what they accomplish, but for how they accomplish it. And then we took that further and we said, not only will we hold you accountable for that, but twice a year you're gonna get an evaluation. And you're gonna get an evaluation on the objectives you achieved as well as how you did against that leadership model. And then your bonus is gonna be tied to your assessment on both of those things. So we put our money where our mouth is, and that has made the difference over those 26 years now as a combined company. And to make sure that we had leaders that knew how to do that, we also invested millions of dollars a year in training all 5,800 of our leaders on the leadership model. And so we pick one of those tenants every year, we look at what's going on in the environment around us, and we say what's most important for our leaders at this moment, and we bring all our leaders from across the country in throughout the year and train 5,800 folks for the last 22 years on leadership. And so when you think about what that does for a culture, it creates a culture where people care about each other, they feel included, and they feel accountable. And that's why, Daniel, we felt so passionately about the opportunity to invest in leaders at BNSF and have the BNSF Neely Leadership Program. Because we recognize that the sooner that you can gear your mind and understand the importance and how that becomes a competitive advantage for you, and the sooner that students understand that, and selfishly, then we could hire them, right. <laughs> um, the sooner that, we, that they understand that and get exposed to that, the better off they'll be long term. Well, something you said there um, as it pertains to your values was that you want people to feel included. You know? And obviously we heard from Bill Moncrief earlier the importance of inclusive excellence at the Neely School and really mm -hmm. all across TCU. Um, can we go deeper there um, sure. on diversity, equity, inclusion? I know you've been a, a real champion for that. How are you thinking about that? Why is that important? And, and, and what are you doing? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so as I mentioned, we had values that were established going on 26 years ago now as a combined company. Inside of those values, um, one of our values absolutely talks about equality. Um, and inside of that value, written 26 years ago, is that every single employee will feel included, that they will have equal access to the opportunity to develop to their, to their full potential. So that's foundational to who we are at BNSF. Now, with that said, um, what we know is that we have more work to do on that. Um, and so um, we approach it with a couple of different focus areas. The first focus area that we focus on is representation. And so we have to start with the idea that, that the people that we are bringing into BNSF are representative of what this country looks like. And so that's the first area we focus on. I can tell you we're doing a good job at that. Um, last year, all of our hires, our new hires, 53% were, were diverse talent. We also focus on development. So when we get diverse talent into the organization, how do we develop those leaders? How do we create leaders that are inclusive, that create an environment where diverse talent um, and all talent can flourish. And, and then the last thing that, that we think about is accountability. Um, what we know is that we have to keep this as a strategic initiative for us. It cannot be a one-off. Um, we have to build pipelines over time that allow us to achieve that. And so, so those are the focus areas that we look at. Now, what, what, at least for us at the railroad, we're really good at measuring stuff. We're an operational company, and what I learned really early on is you don't, we don't achieve things unless we measure them. And so the, the way that we really focus on this is we look at measuring it in, an, in a, and the idea is we measure it in, up, and out. And so for us, it's in is are we bringing diverse talent into the organization? And when I say we measure it, we, we don't just measure the 53% diverse talent, we measure in the different functional areas of our company, at different uh, organizational levels inside the company. We ask employees when they get ready to fill jobs inside the company. We ask them to, to tell us about their diversity options and candidates that they have, and so we measure all of that. That's the in part of it. Up is basically how are we doing on developing and promoting diverse talent? And continuing to look at over time, are we making progress? Now the out part of it is we're gonna work really hard on retention of that talent, but what we also know is that we do lose talent. 
And so when the out happens, um, Judy Carter, who's here today, our Chief Human Resources Officer, we look at exit interviews and we say, what happened? How did we miss the mark here? Why did somebody choose to leave us? Now, sometimes people choose to leave us because, as I mentioned with our, our leadership program, we do a really good job training people. So, so that's a compliment. I get it. We lose people. But we're selfish. We're going to try to hold on to every one of those people. And so we work really hard at retention strategies and understanding when somebody leaves our organization, why did they leave? Now, to your question, have we made progress? So I've actually been with the railroad 30 years, Dr. Moncrief, but thank you for not saying 30. I started when I was like 10. Um, <laughs> But so, so when I look back to where, where we were when I started 30 years ago, we have absolutely made progress. But I will tell you, this, this is more than anything that I deal with. This is a journey, and we have a, a, a long way to go. Yeah. Well, um, I appreciate that. And you know, I think there's even great lessons for, for TCU and, and Neely to take away from you know, how you're approaching that and how we can continue to go on that absolutely. journey together. Yep. Um, I know we're almost to the Q&A side, so uh, if you haven't filled out your card yet, please, uh, please do so now. I think it'll be collected. Um, and so while that's occurring, uh, we have a lot of students here today, and yeah. I'm excited about that. And you know, they are, they're looking to join the most aspirational employers. And so what, what advice do you have for our young people as they're preparing, and what, what sort of dimensions and skills and traits are you looking for? Sure. So um, let, me, let me just start by saying you're in a great place. Um, you know, obviously, we're biased. Our entire family are horned frogs for several generations. We bleed purple. So it's, this is a 100% biased comment. Um, but with that said, um, you know, there's, we often talk about the it factor at TCU. And I just want to tell you how the it factor played out for me personally. Um, you're going to get the right curriculum here. There's no question about it. You just heard you know, a top business school. So that's a given. Um, what you might not realize that's happening right now are two really important things that, that's the it factor at TCU. Um, and that is you have professors like Dr. Moncrief, Dr. Barry that I had, a finance professor of mine in my master's program. Professors that invest in you, um, that aren't just here to teach you the curriculum, they care about you. And you could see the pride that Dr. Moncrief had talking about the different parts of it. And that filters through into the classroom. And, and you just don't get that at every school. And so, so that's number one. Um, and then number two is take advantage of the alumni network that we have here. Um, I'm not going to embarrass um, an alumni in the room. But um, I will tell you that while Dr. Moncrief and Dr. Berry and people like that helped me find the internship and, and subsequently 30-year career at BNSF, there was a pair of alumni that helped make sure my resume stood out at BNSF. And I'm not going to embarrass them and talk about how there's an honor school named after them <laughs> or how, how someone in this room is really instrumental in Kinder Frogs or the Frog Fountain or anything like that the business school, because um, I'd embarrass them. But, but you all know them. And, and my guess is a lot of us in the room have been impacted by that couple as well. But, but that's the difference that TCU makes, is that, that we care about each other. We take care of each other. And, and so take advantage of that. Get to know people. Get to have a network. Um, and then what I'm going to ask you to do, after you come to work for BNSF, um, then take care, of, take care of the next group coming out. Um, because I feel, I feel a responsibility to do that for sure because of what I was given. I love it. I love it. And you're going to love this question. I'm um, not sure. Which table did it come from? <laughs> I don't think Eddie Clark's here, so I'm probably OK. okay so. It's a two-parter. OK. Um, how has transitioning from a publicly traded company to private ownership changed your, the way you operate the business? And then um, what's Warren Buffett like? Um, so transitioning from a publicly traded company to a private is awesome. So, <laughs> um, so and working for uh, Berkshire is awesome as well. Um, so, so uh, you know, I, he, there are a lot of great things about um, being able to look beyond the next quarter, right? Um, and, and really good companies, public companies do that as well. It's just that there's the constant questioning on a quarterly basis. Um, and so... I will tell you that, that I don't miss that at all. Um, we, we are a company that, by the nature of what we do, we, we build assets that last for 50, 75 years. That's a hard story to tell on a quarterly basis. It just is. Um, so um, it's great to have 
an owner like Berkshire and Warren that look at it literally as a family business. And I remember when Warren and, and Berkshire bought us, he came to talk to a group of us, and he looked at us and he said, I want you to think about this like this is your family's business. And every investment decision you make and every decision you make, I want you to make it for the next 100 years. So, I mean, that's a pretty great way to operate your company. Um, I will tell you, though, that, that we, ha we are, we are rel relatively unique in the sense that um, having been a publicly traded company for as long as we have, we still worked really hard, and I work really hard to keep that muscle. And what I mean by that is that at the end of the quarter, um, once we finish, um, I actually have the leaders of our business come and do the quarterly presentation much as if they were, they were talking to the street about the quarter. I just think it's a good muscle for us to have. We, now, the benefit is we get to compare ourselves to, our, to the Union Pacific, CSX, Norfolk Southern, et cetera, without having to do that in a public forum. So, so that is an advantage. But I think it's really critically important as a private com company not to lose the discipline to compare yourselves against how, are, how is your operating income versus the Union Pacific, how is your operating ratio, all those kinds of things, and to have our leaders step up and be able to own that and talk about it. So um, I, I think that's really important to balance that as a private company. Um, now, to the question about Warren, I mean, he's just like you you all see him, he's terrific. Um, he, he cares about the business, he cares about people, he cares about investing in this country. I mean, he talked about when he bought us that it was a bet on the US and, and the economy, and he believes that. And, and so, um, you know, I, at the last board meeting, he said, Katie, just, you know, I just want you to come and talk to the board. And he said, you don't really have to prepare anything. Oh, okay. <laughs> right. So, okay, which meant, I, which meant I had to prepare for everything, right? Um, and, and, you know, he, he and I just sat up in front of the board, and it was like this. It was just Q&A, and let's talk about what we're doing and what do we have to do next, and how do we build a moat to be the best at what, you know, let's, intermodal is, our, you know, is kind of, the, that's what our biggest growth opportunity. What are we going to do to continue to be the, the intermodal leader? Let's talk about it. It was, it was literally just like that, Q&A. So it, it's... It's great to work for Warren. So. Yeah, absolutely. Um, obviously, ESG, environmental social governance issues, are becoming really important. Sure. Um, and, and, and really for all industries, right? Sometimes it gets uh, tethered to energy and other, other, uh, other yeah. dimensions. But, it, but it's really um, corporate America as we know it today. Um, talk to us a little bit about ESG, how that's impacting your company. Um, and ha how it might impact how you operate in the future? Yeah, I mean, I think for us, the biggest piece of that is the environmental piece of it. Um, and and I, I've already talked quite a bit about that. Um, you know, it, it is an interesting, it, it is, it is interesting to think about the opportunities ahead of us in, in all of those areas. Um, and it also presents a little bit of a unique challenge for us, frankly, being a part of Berkshire. Because, you know, from a, from a governance perspective, um, you know, there, there's, there's certainly opportunities and it'll be interesting over time how that evolves. Um, but I would say for us, the bulk of where we, f we focus our ESG efforts is around the environmental side of it. Um, you know, and, and, and frankly, we work with industries that are extremely focused on ESG. Um, and so, so going forward, I, I think that, that the governance part of that will continue to evolve, um, certainly over the next several years uh, for us at Berkshire and BNSF. And then from an environmental perspective, you know, I talked a little bit about the locomotives. We're also focusing on um, everything inside of our facilities. So we use trucks inside of our facilities, hostlers, handlers, um, pieces of that. Um, and so, so we're going to continue to focus on all of that. We're making huge investments in that. So. Yeah, and we are too. I mean, we have a whole graduate certificate now yep. in ESG, and right. um, our Neely Fellows Honors Program has a class on sure. ESG at the undergraduate level, and, yep. and so it really is upon us. And so it's good to, good to hear what you're doing. Um, I love this one. Uh, what's your best habit? Jeff? <laughs> <laughs> um, oh, gosh. Um, wow, that's a good question. Um, I think... You know, I think, I don't know that it's my best habit, but it's one of the things I've worked really hard at over the years. And that is, I think one of the challenges as you move through an organization and you've been at a place as long as I have and you've worked, I've probably worked 20 different roles at BNSF. Um, one of the things that could become a bad habit 
is that you think you have all the answers and that you stop listening and you stop um, listening to the quiet voices particularly. And so one of the things I've worked really hard at um, on our leadership model, one of our tenants is communicate, communicate, communicate. And the very first tenant under communicate, communicate, communicate is listen. And, and when you work in an industry like ours, which is 24 by 7, 365, a lot of high intensity people that, that are, are great at what they do, you sometimes can get sucked into a place where you're being very um, authoritative, autocratic, you know, that you're, you're really telling people how things should be. And that, that's a bad place to be. And as, as, as a leader, it's a really bad place to be. And so I have worked very hard, especially in conversations, um, when people come into my office, when I'm out in the field, when I'm listening to folks, questioning and then listening and not answering right out. Because you, you can stifle a lot of conversation and a lot of great creativity if you do that. Um. This next question I know is important because it's been asked by both an undergraduate marketing major and a local uh, vice president for marketing. How, have, how has your marketing background impacted your career? Oh, is this from Dr. Moncrief? <laughs> um, so I think for me, um, one of the things that we had to do very early on in the marketing discipline here is you have to get up in front of people. And you have to be able to think on your feet. And I think Neely and the marketing program, and I, I know this is across other disciplines as well, but I think they've done an even better job than when I was here about putting people in those uncomfortable situations and, and really getting comfortable with being able to um, think on your feet, um, talk about what's important, uh, adjust in the moment, and do those kinds of things. So I, I think that was a big part of it. Even back then, Dr. Moncrief and I were talking before breakfast this morning. I was telling him about how I remember from his class doing a project on Renfro salsa here in Fort Worth and, um, and having to get up and present that and go, go meet that family here in Fort Worth. And I can remember being terrified of having to get up and talk without notes about that. And so I, I just think that that was very helpful early on in being able to do that. Um, and I know from talking to Caroline that, that that's a big part of the program now is, is putting students in those roles to be able to, to do that. And then I think the other side of that is I, I spent part of my master's with Dr. Barry focused on the finance side of it. And I think balancing out the ability to, to kind of approach that perspective from a creative marketing perspective while balancing that with what I have to do from a financial perspective every day. To me, that was the best of both worlds with the masters and then the, the undergrad in marketing. Yeah, makes, makes great sense. Yeah. And if you've had 20 roles in 30 years, right, having that interdisciplinary approach and oh, perspective has yeah. got to be huge. Absolutely. I mean, in, and a bulk of my career was spent in the commercial area on the marketing side and, and having to be creative and come up with strategies and, and work with Amazon. We brought Amazon for the first on and being able to think about what's important to them and how we satisfy their customers. And that, I mean, that translates right back to what you learn in Neely. So. Yeah. I love it. Um, this one's fun. If you could change one thing about your company, what would it be and why? I think it goes back to the diversity piece of it for me. Um, you know, I, I talked about that 53% of our new hires are diverse. But when we look at people of color and women in our company, we are still well behind um, what this country looks like. And so what a great opportunity that I, I get the opportunity to make an impact on that. Um, but it goes beyond diversity, and it goes beyond um, that I'm going to need to be able to, working with our team, find a way to change the nature of the job. And that won't be just to attract diverse talent. That'll be to, to attract all talent, because we work in a hard industry. And it is difficult now. Um, Given the demands, I talked about again, I mean, we, we are, our field people do incredible work. Um, and, um, you know, it, for, for many, many leaders in our company, it is a 24 by 7 kind of job. And so what we know at BNSF is that we have to work on the employee value proposition. We have to work on why people come to work. 
When, when I read those exit interviews with Judy, people don't leave our company because of pay. People rarely leave companies because of pay. They, they, they leave, like I said, because they don't feel included, they don't feel like what they do matters, and they don't feel like they can manage what they have going on in their lives. And so for us, what we have to figure out is that employee value proposition. And that employee value proposition goes all the way from, I know what I do is meaningful and it gives me passion and a drive. I have good benefits that work for my family. I can balance what it is that I want to do in life outside of work, and then I'm compensated fairly. And so, so I don't have to change the whole thing, but I have to evolve it. I have to, because what worked 30 years ago, it doesn't work to attract people today. That's right. Yeah, in innovating at all turns at every part of the organization, whether Absolutely. that's through technology or sort of approach to talent management. Right. Yeah, right. I love it. Well, I know we're almost out of time, but I just want to take a certain moment to say thank you um, for all you do personally and all that BNSF has done over the years for the Neely School. Of course. You know, um, one of the brag points that uh, Dr. Moncrief left off is we have a top 20 supply chain management program, an entire innovation center dedicated to supply chain management. And I know that would not be possible, that partnership with industry without support of, of companies like yours. Um, you touched on the leadership development through the BNSF uh, leadership program. Mm -hmm. um, I have a chance to work with a subset of those students every day. In fact, they've been, some of the leadership has been involved in uh, helping co-author the five-year strategic plan that Great. Neely's unveiling this, this semester. And so um, giving us the platform to make that type of difference and then to see those returns is, is, is really meaningful. Thank um, you. Well, we're, we're, self, we're selfishly doing it because we get lots of great TCU alumni. I think we have, and Deborah will help me, 165? 170 wow. TCU alumni, and a large percentage of our leadership team have at least one degree from TCU. So several have, several have two. Yeah. So. so it's working. It's, it's working. working. Yeah. yeah. Well, we, we love that, right? And I think a business school, um, certainly in the 21st century, has to operate at the intersection of the academy and industry. And we have to work backwards from the market, just like you're working yeah. backwards from some of your customer sentiments. You know, we're doing the same thing okay. to make sure we have the right curriculum and programs and learning environment um, to, to meet the needs of the world's great organizations. And certainly BNSF is, is one of those. You know, we've covered so much ground today um, in a short amount of time. Uh, we talked about the importance of of, you know, canvassing and sensing the marketplace and, and seeing those changes and then adjusting your operations and your strategy uh, as a result, whether that's the change into consumer goods or some of the labor market pressures that, that we touched upon. We talked about understanding your role in your industry and where you are, you know, in the value chain, in the supply chain, and not just optimizing your organization for, for what you do, but understanding that, you know, in many ways you have to uh, be part of a, a, almost a catalyst for improvement and, 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 and optimization across all dimensions of, of, the, of the value chain and of your, your industry. And we talked a lot about um, not just looking at others as competitors, but, but collaborators and partners, and how collectively we could be stronger together than we are separately. Um, understanding the legal and regulatory environment and you know, legislation and, and how that might impact how you operate your business and staying on the forefront of, of, of where society is. Um, and then a lot of depth around culture and values and how that translates into importance and in, in making people feel included and understanding why someone comes to work every day, and when they, when they leave, understanding why they left and how you can really foster an environment of, and a culture of continuous improvement and really understanding the very human dimension as to what we all do, certainly those of us privileged to be in formal leadership positions. Um, it's really been a remarkable conversation. I think you can see why she is one of my favorite people in the whole wide world, <laughs> Katie Farmer. Thank, thank you so much Appreciate for being it. here with us today.